Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Space Snacks. Today, my special guest is an actually a good friend of mine, Ryan Kobrick. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? <laughs> Hi, I'm on Space Snacks. <laughs> good, how are you? I was holding my breath for the intro there. I was like, <gasps> Uh oh! Don't make okay. any noise. Be quiet. Don't breathe. Okay. <sighs> okay. We're, it's we like go. live live mics in the background here. Yeah. It's really yeah. great to have you on Space Snacks. Um, th for those of you in the audience, Ryan and I are good friends. We actually have a company together, Flight Ready Systems. But I want to tell a quick story, Ryan, and that uh -oh. is, <laughs> in two thousand and nine, you tweeted to me about the NASA astronaut program selection because I was a finalist. And I think I wrote back, you, you said congratulations or something like that. And I wrote, thanks, or something simple. <laughs> and it wasn't until 10 years later when I was at Yuri's night and I was like, wow, this guy Ryan Kubrick's kind of cool. I need to tweet him, <laughs> follow him. And I went into my Twitter feed to, yeah. to send you a private message and I saw that and I was like, I could have been friends with this guy 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? I guess everything just, you know, happens at a, a certain time and moment. And, um, you know, it's the, I like to think of it as people are crossing orbits and eventually they might cross orbits again, or maybe their orbits will sync up for a while or, yeah. you know, or maybe the orbits will completely link. And so those are kind of the relationships, I guess we establish with people. So yeah, you never know if you you might someone you might send a message on social media, and a decade later you might be starting a company with them. Who knows? <laughs> I know. I, I mean, I think that that's one of the interesting things about our digital world now, and especially because yeah. we're we're all so dependent on our digital connections. It's this time in particular. So. Yeah. I want to talk to you about why space. Um, what is it that have you always been into space? Is that something that you just knew and loved from the beginning, or did that evolve over time? So I think it's something that was with me really early. And I guess as I get older, I start to question like, is, is that true? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I remember writing maybe over a decade ago or something for like my first astronaut application, or even like for school applications that. Um, I even remember how they started. They were all like, ever since I was little, I always looked up and dreamed about going into the stars. And I, I mean, it's like something about that kind of a sentence, if you will, is maybe it's in our like DNA code that's telling us to sit. Like it's it's like this this rhythm or this clock or something that just keeps coming up out of us. But um, I was interested in space exploration pretty young. Um, I do remember kind of my first trip to Kennedy Space Center when I was, I think I was five or six, um, my parents lived in Clearwater, Florida, and we lived, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. So we'd come down to Florida uh, to visit them roughly once a year, and we'd go out to Disney. And one year we went all the way from coast to coast uh, to the Space Coast. And, you know, I, I barely remember the trip because obviously I was really young, but I, you know, vividly remember getting a sticker book and having a whole bunch of like space stickers and, um actually have found that sticker book i still have it and i have these two shuttle photos of that have my a couple of my stickers like on them and so you know it's the weird things it's like you know the a material object is what i connected with to have that memory um so i know i had that at least that part like you know ksc might have been an early very early influence on top of everything else but in star wars like before everything and yeah this will come <laughs> up um I was three or four when Return of the Jedi came out. Um, and I know that when I was, you know, four or five, I had like the hat, I had a hat and everything. And um, so I was a huge fan of Luke Skywalker. Then we had all the toys of all the figures and some of the vehicles. And I still have some of those figures hidden away so no one touches my stuff. Um, <laughs> so Star Wars, yeah, Star Wars definitely a, a big influence as well about like exploring in that this is, normal for us to be you know going from planet to planet and um having these adventures i guess you could say i and i love the shirt that you're wearing because Thank you, you. Have yeah. Star Wars shirt on yeah and, uh 
I was seven when the original Star Wars came out and I remember seeing it in the movies. And so I, I actually had some of the original movie posters that came out and okay. don't have nice. them anymore, unfortunately. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to think about those early influences when we were kids. And I yeah. know that you have kids. Um, and so are you filling them with Star <laughs> space? Oh, <stuff>? are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, um, we, since the pandemic started, uh, we've introduced our kids to the original trilogy in their theatrical versions, not the uh, updated version on shot first. Um, and uh, so my son Rafi's four and a half and my daughter Maddie is, you know, a year and four months. Um, so we watched those three and before that, you know, he'd always might he Rafi would be like, "Space is your thing." I'm, you know, I'm not that into space, and they'd be like, "Ah, oh, ah." Oh. And then now it's like, um, after watching Star Wars, he's like, "I'm really into Star Wars." I'm like, "Yes." Jen, Jen is an even bigger fan than I am in Star Wars, so um, it's kind of funny that that uh, how things work out. So uh, he has some of my Lego and other Legos, that, and they're all the characters, and even like little play fighting here and there where. It's like Boba Fett versus Han Solo getting frozen in carbonite. Um, so uh, it's a lot of fun. Sorry, my dog decided to join the call. No, that's okay. Yeah. And so, Teddy, come here. Bring Teddy, it, put, put him in your lap, that's okay. fine. He's gonna get a cameo and then he's gonna get thrown out. Oh. Um, just because uh, he will be distracting. But so, he's so cute. Yeah, this is, uh, so this is Teddy, Teddy Mercury. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, mm. so, so um, Teddy is a Catan de Tullier, so they're, he's hypoallergenic, originally from Madagascar, um, and my cousins actually have their dog Crouton, and um, so because of, I had slight allergies um, when we were kind of wanting to have, I've always, I've, I grew up with dogs, so I like, I really wanted to have our own dog, and eventually Teddy came into our lives, I guess as our first kid before the, our fur baby before our two other babies. Um, oh, very cute. Yeah. And so do you have, you know, thinking about uh, space and food, um, do you have any favorite food that you like to eat? Yeah, um, junk food. <laughs> you junk food junkie? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a sweet tooth and I also salt tooth and a junk tooth. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, even growing up, my like aunt would call me, or my uncle would call me treat man. So just cause we, we had a lot of snacks around the house. And um, so, I mean, those are always my favorites, but I mean, naturally pizza is gonna be on that list of favorite foods. And, um, you know, I love, I am a crust person. I do like crust, so. Um, and I like my variety of types of pizzas, mostly when it's crispy crust or if it, when the thin crust is actually crispy and not soggy, then that's like my super favorite. Right. Um, but I do, you know, I do, you know, that's a big part of the pizza for me. So, so you're, uh, um, so you're not, are you a Chicago deep dish or New York thin and crispy? Ooh. So if it's, if the New York is thin and crispy and it's not like, flopping off the plate and which is part of the experience and folding in half and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And if you're interested in the correct way of eating a New York pizza, uh, John Stewart had actually uh, a really cool segment about eating New York pizza. Um, but yeah, I love New York pizza is pretty awesome. Um, but I love, yeah, there I've had some Chicago deep dish pizza where I'm like, where has this been my whole life? Like when I was visiting for a conference, someone took us to this like, special place where it's like you went into the underground of this like stone building and they had these wood ovens going and they brought out the pizza. I'm like, this doesn't look like, you know, the other restaurants of Chicago pizza we went to. This looks like, you know, this is like 12 hours of labor into a pizza. Like this is intense. And I, it, that was pretty amazing. Like it, it left the imprint, I guess. It's making you a, a, a reason to go back. Yeah, exactly. I'd love to, you know, Chicago's cool. So back. if you're going to be eating pizza, um, <laughs> being the explorer that you are, are you going to be eating it on Mars, moon, 
you obviously eat it on Earth, but where is your top exploration place that you would sure. love to go to? Well, I guess we'd have to have pizza on the moon, right? Because there's cheese up there. Um, <laughs> so for me, um, I, I definitely would consider myself um, in terms of uh, personal destination, I would love to go to the moon. I'd love mm -hmm. to like spend a year on the moon. Um, in terms of humanity though, I think Mars is our ultimate destination um, and what we need to focus on. And right now at least, and this happens to change every four to eight years or, you know, ish, um, that <laughs> right now the moon is a big part of that and that's exciting. I mean, it was part of my, even my graduate research was on lunar dust abrasion. And so mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, I, things that I would like to offer in this kind of exploration age. So I, I would love to go to the moon and I kind of think of it as like the reverse of being here on earth is that I love to look up at the sky and look at the moon. And so I think about like, what would it be like to be sitting or walking or looking at the window on the moon um, up at earth? And like, obviously the most iconic photo ever was earth rise by Apollo eight. And there's a reason for that because it's just like, just so like, it's so unreal and real at the same time that I just, that's, I find that fascinating. Um, and it's funny because I've seen things like people, and I have to correct this science, correct that something now, like people post like, oh, they're, they're not seeing the whole earth because the shadow of the moon is blocking it. And I'm like, oh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh -huh. But let's talk about if you have two balls in space, both pointing at the sun and you're on the sunny side of this one. And that one's over here, your neighbor, and you're both looking at the sun and there's going to be a shadowed side, dark side, not, uh, or excuse me, I shouldn't say the word dark side either. Right. Should be saying far side, far side. Um, that's not going to be illuminated. And so it, you know, I think about it more and more, even in the last uh, month and a half, I've thought about it a lot more when I like walk, take the dog for a walk or whatever, as I, I look up, and I kind of think about what phase the moon is in, in which way the sun was just, and I just kind of like have this, I, you know, it's almost like the Nicole Stott moment, like <laughs> I'm standing on a planet kind of moment where I'm looking up and I actually feel like I can, you know, I have a better sense of like the entire um, solar plane of the entire solar system. And then I start kind of looking at the bright objects and I start seeing like, you know, the planets are near that same plane. And just like, you just have this like, swooshing arc almost like earth has its own rings that you're looking up into space at the same time and it's like it's a pretty cool feeling to to have that understanding and the one thing i found that i wanted because i wanted to try to translate this to students um a while ago and so there's a bunch of animations that are online like moon phases so if you look for those i'm sure you'll find a couple of videos and um it's do that go figure out what phase the moon is in and then kind of Where's the sun? Where's the moon? Where Venus is near the moon right now? Um, you know, a lot of things, celestial things are lining up for that kind of opportunity. You know, it's interesting because that's such a big misconception um, is the you know phases of the moon and trying to get that out of people's notion of how what yeah. they're seeing in the sky. So if you're going to be on the moon and you're going to be eating your nice thin <laughs> crispy pizza, <laughs> yeah. Um, who are you eating it with? With you, of course. <laughs> I didn't to say that. Me, yay. Yeah. You're the first um, one. Like, I'm bringing Cyan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's a great question. I, I don't know. I want it to be real, you know? I don't want mm -hmm. to be like, um, I will take Albert Einstein and Jerry Seinfeld. And, you know, <laughs> but, like, you know, the, it's... I want my family if I can have my family there. I, you know, the, yeah. the, the people that you share meals with all the time or uh, that are important to you that you want to be having that with. And I'm not part of any kind of Facebook pizza lover or whatever <laughs> group, but if I was, and if your group, if someone out there is a, a member of a, a specific item like pizza and they, then they probably want their like club with them, you know? Yeah, you know, the, the thing about it is you, you can bring somebody who inspires you a lot of times you think of those yeah. people, but in reality, man, I want my best friend, you know, yeah. or my husband or somebody. But the interesting thing about that is my, my husband's not a space guy. So I'm right. like, Ooh, so 
I want to bring somebody who might not appreciate it on the same level as me? Or do I want to bring, but would it change his perspective and make yeah. him more of a space guy? And so those are some That's of the true. things that I think, do I bring somebody who would be as giddy as me or somebody who I would hopefully shift their perspective? Um, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. So talking about family and the, are you, do you cook? Are you the grill dad? Are you a uh, takeout kind of guy? Are you, do you like to bake? I, I kind of think of myself as a, uh, a primitive cook, like open fire type heat, like direct heat to object kind of person. So uh, most things that I can make, I guess you could say are in a pan or in a pot, or something on the stove top. Uh, yes, I like to grill, but don't probably don't grill as much as um, I would like to, or cause I mean, it's just, that's the way it is. Um, and uh, for me, I, I barely know how to use an oven. Like, um, not that I don't know how to use it. Like I, I'm probably, you know, one of those people, I keep walking into people's houses and reprogramming their clock on everything. Cause I'm, I, I see a clock that's the wrong time. I'm like, can I fix that? And they're like, you know how? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And they're like, boop, boop, boop. Um, so like for me, like the oven is like something that it's, it's not a challenge. It's just, I don't know. It's something about it that just doesn't speak to me, I, I guess. But um, you are not a baker. <laughs> no, I'm not. And um, I was thinking about this and um, um this is kind of like where the engineer in me comes out. And uh, I've actually prepared a reading about oh, this. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so let me uh, share an image here and then hopefully okay, and you I'll can share it. it. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to hide screen. myself once I put this up. Okay. So hopefully this works. Okay. Hold is, on. Is that showing up? Hopefully. I hope so. Um, I think you have to click. Oh, oh, there we go. That's pretty cool. But I also have it in front of me. So I'd like to share this poem. This is the, I guess, Dr. Kobrick reads Dr. Seuss. Um, and you have it there on the, on the screen, but it might not be able to read it. Here we go. We took a look. We saw a nook. On his head, he had a hook. On his hook, he had a book. On his book was how to cook. We sat, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We saw him sit and tried to cook. He took a look at the book on the hook, but a nook can't read, so a nook can't cook. So what good to a nook is a hook cookbook? There we go. Okay, we're all done with that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I even if you think about that a little bit, it's like it's not that I can't read, and I feel like the kind of engineer in me is like, okay, these are instructions. I like instructions. Let's do this. And so the few things that I've baked or attempted have been very like, I am measuring this to the, you know, the gram, the milliliter, whatever, um, because that's what it says here. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, spoken like a true engineer. Uh, yeah. and, and that's why baking, yeah, I'm a cook. So I am yeah. a dash of this and a dabble of that and see if it tastes good. But baking is so precise. And yeah. talking about engineering, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do now. Sure. Um, my background's in aerospace engineering for the most part. Um, I guess you could really say that my background is I'm interested in the way things work. Um, and that's kind of what's driven various interests. And human spaceflight is my passion. So from all of that, um, where I'm at now is that I'm an assistant professor of spaceflight operations at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Daytona Beach. Um, and I'm the principal investigator of the Spacesuit Utilization of Innovative Technology Laboratory, or Suit Lab. Uh, we're focused on human performance, and spacesuits are kind of like the centerpiece. They're kind of what inspire me and others. Um, doesn't mean we're only doing spacesuit-related activities, but it does mean that we're like 95% of the time focused on human spaceflight and operations. Um, so we work on IVA, which is intravehicular activity, where they're sitting in the cockpit uh, range of motion to see, you know, what buttons can they reach at the right time if they if they're wearing a suit or not wearing a suit, um, and so we use we use motion capture for those kind of studies, and then uh, the common link here to Cyan is the analog research where we're out in the field doing EVAs or extravehicular activities, meaning you're outside of your spacecraft, and that is also usually in a spacesuit, um, and for these analogs, you're in a you know simulated Mars environment and 
mission and wearing a simulated spacesuit, um, and then conducting actual uh, field activities. So I look at a lot of the biometrics, um, physical metrics like GPS tracking, um, and really the idea is to make crews more efficient when they get out to the field and keep them safe and healthy. Yeah, that's really cool. And um, you also do things with your students and you take them to kind of, you do you run your own little analog to some extent, yeah. but it's yeah. as uh, Aquanauts, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, um, so um, that's definitely part of it. Uh, it we, you know, we're weeks away from knowing if it's even happening this summer. So it's kind of like, it's a hurry up and wait. It's difficult for everyone because we're like, we really want to go, but we also really want a proper decision made. Yeah. Um, and, Tell us what uh, you're so and what the, you're doing. Yeah, so the past three years, uh, and the program has changed year to year, but the last three years have been involved with the Greek partner, Get Lost, and um, uh, we've had an awesome time with uh, working with them where we spent two weeks living on a sailboat, um, going island to island in the Greek Cyclade Island, Cyclades. And, um, you know, that's you know my one of my favorite parts because I grew up as a sailor. I actually raced competitively for over 10 years and seven world championships. And, um, you know, Isn't that about you? I keep sailing. Like I, the last thing I did was like a Florida state championship a few years ago. Um, and so I, you know, sailing is a big part of my life. Um, and um, so that was kind of what attracted me to this uh, summer abroad program was like, they're going to live on a sailboat. What? Like, I don't even care about the rest of the details. Um, but then they, we spent a week in the mountains in the Greek mountains. Um, and so that was kind of the baseline for, for it for the first few years. And then last year we actually took them uh, for the fourth week to Cologne, Germany to go to uh, DLR, which is the German Aerospace Center and we were able to interact with their scientists and go to the European Space Agency's European Astronaut Center, the EAC, um, and spend time in kind of the one of their first student summer showcase that we helped uh, initiate. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, this year, we're supposed to be going to Portugal to the International Conference on Environmental Systems, where they would meet all the life support and spacesuit experts. Um, and then after that, we'd be going to the Canary Islands for two weeks to scuba dive and uh, basically explore volcanoes and link that to the comparative planetology of volcanic activity or former vo volcanic activity on the moon and on Mars. Um, and so as part of that, our analog, if you will, there's a few, right? You're living on a sailboat, you're confined with your crew. Um, you're not really sure what the schedule looks like. Um, you, you know, you've got all these other factors to, to keep in uh, check for your health and attending classes. And so you've got a mental load going on. Um, the hiking part in the mountains. So you're like, you've got your, we actually hiked Mount Olympus, which was three days up and one day down. Um, and so again, you're like, you know, what do I need to, for this trip? What kind of proper clothing or lack of clothing, uh, snacks, because we know we're gonna get to a place where we're gonna stop for dinner kind of thing, but you know, you need to have a lunch or whatever packed. Um, so all these things are important. And then, so the scuba diving part of it is to specifically match to what would it be like to walk on the moon? So we actually changed the weight distribution of the, not not significantly, but enough to feel it, where uh, the students will just kind of try to walk on the surface of the ground. Um, and they're kind of like, you know, you're you're not neutrally buoyant because you do have a little bit more weight than your buoyancy. And they're kind of all over the place. Uh, then we add a weight belt onto them and it sinks them down and we do the math with them to figure out what would it be like to be one six, you know, gravity load, if you will. Uh, and they are like, oh yeah, I'm a lot more anchored. Uh, and then we add more weight onto the back of them, which simulates the um, primary life support system um, or during Apollo, it was called the portable life support system because it wasn't attached uh, directly. And we put weights in the back and it changes their center of gravity. Um, and so one thing the Apollo astronauts experienced were, was that their backwards seat G or center of gravity actually caused them to fall all over the place. They had difficulties um, getting up and down because of how pressurized the spacesuit was as well. Um, and so, you know, if you Google astronauts falling on the moon, you'll find some fun stuff. Um, I, I won't do that now because it might be, we might be going too deep into the sharing screen uh, <laughs> ether there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, um, um, gives them an experience of what it's like to be moonwalkers. You know, that's really fantastic. Um, and, 
I make an excellent TA. So <laughs> <that's the thing. laughs> yeah, anytime. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but so what about food? Because food's such a big part of that. What kinds of things do you like to have in those types of environments, whether it is with your students or being in an mm. analog? I know you did FMARS, yeah. you've done MDRS, you've done all of these kinds of things. Uh, what do you see as the, the type of food that you like to have? Yeah, um, so Space Snacks, of course. Let's bring it right back to Space Snacks. Um, uh, I like I like I peanuts, trail mix type uh, salty snacks. I think um, I feel like oh, I'm getting energy from this. You know, like I don't feel like I'm just like wasting junk into me. Although I like I mentioned, I like junk food. But um, so those kind of things, like I feel like um, I'm powering up or something when I have them, and and I like them. Um, yeah, I'm so a like, salt girl. Yeah, I like like peanut, yeah, peanut butter is like my staple. So, uh, you know, people that knew me growing up knew that I could probably have peanut butter sandwiches every day for lunch and I wouldn't care. Like, I'd be fine. Wait, so, so, but yeah. hunky or smooth? Because it makes a difference. Um, the real question is salted or unsalted. Oh, <laughs> Or it, it. I've discovered that, but I I usually have we have natural peanut butter, mm -hmm. um, so it's naturally chunkier uh, now, not before, and um, now when I go and have like a um, a name brand peanut butter that has like sugar, salt like loaded into it, I'm like, what is this? This, you know, I, I'm I'm becoming a purist. I think of my, but I like to add a little bit of salt when I when I put peanut butter like on a bagel or toast or whatever. I usually add a little bit of salt. Um, so mostly smooth, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Natural chunky, but not like chunks of peanuts. Like, okay. not like unnatural natural. It's like they've we've made smooth peanut butter. Now we're gonna go bang and smash some nuts and throw it into the peanut butter and combine two different things. So um, yeah, it's all about having one peanut sitting on top, right? And who gets that one peanut? <laughs> I think it's interesting that you um, that you've been able to make that switch to the natural side yeah. of peanut butter. Growing up with the you know the refined sugar added yeah. salty, uh, and is that mainly because of having kids? Um, no, um, that I credit Jen, my wife, with uh, just you know healthier living, buying the right things, and just adapting to it to the point of like, yeah, I actually prefer it. Although, like I said, I do like to add salt, which is not part of the, you know, staple and main, main ingredient of peanut and oil. Or <laughs> So um, so there's that slight change, but yeah. Um, I think I totally derailed the question, but yeah, like snacks, I mean, I'm always game for snacks, but for long duration missions, I mean, this has been mentioned by lots of different people, is that um, the, um, the psychological and benefit and actual benefits of fresh food is huge. Um, we had, uh, when we were in the Arctic for four months, we actually had two arrow grows that we tried to stagger. And so we had leaves going most on most of them was like, we found that salad was the most beneficial just in terms of like, there's seven of us, we need to make a lot of food. Yeah. Um, and um, something that would be important is just like good spice balance um, mm -hmm. to have as well. Um, cause then you can cover up anything, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to be like historically saying this is like a fact, but maybe you can half verify it is that, um, in civil, some civilizations, um, spices became dominant because they were covering up the fact that the, the meat quality was lower or was not necessarily rotting, but they wanted to, um, uh, make it last longer. And so spices ended up becoming not a preser not just a preservative because you need salting for that, but to actually help cover up, uh, you know, quality as well. That, that wouldn't so, surprise me because like, I yeah. mean, we don't, don't we kind of do that now <laughs> still? Yeah, um, and so that became in the Arctic. So we didn't. So when you think about it, you're like, oh, four months. So wait, oh wait, four months. You didn't have a hamburger, did you? Um, well, we had texture vegetable protein, and we had two types. I don't yeah. even know if you could call it beef and chicken, but that's what the bucket said. And it basically was like, it looked like, you know, crushed up um, bacon bits is what it would look, I guess, look like. And so we turned that into a lot of different things. Um, 
the meatballs were kind of a favorite, I think. Um, but with great food comes great uh, responsibility or great like <laughs> aftermath, or I don't know how you want to, I, I can't politely say it, but uh, it definitely hit everyone's GI track. Um, so it was kind of a favorite going in and a least favorite going out. So <laughs> all, all the same. Uh, yeah. Our time is almost up, but okay. I want to ask one last question. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite celestial object? And if so, what is it and why? Um, so they're all amazing, of course, right? Yay. Um, no, they, I, I've always loved Pluto. Um, Pluto's been kind of a, uh, oh, hey, Pluto, how you doing? Um, so thanks for this graphic that you put together. Uh, it's a good thing I didn't change my mind, right? Um, so Pluto, uh, always been fascinated with Pluto. I remember like in one of, in grade school, having a, a poster project on Pluto and Mercury and, and Pluto's also my favorite Disney character. So it's just this like, um, deep rooted psychological connection between the two as well. So I think that was kind of cool. And just a interesting kind of side fun fact is that, uh, our son Rafi was born, um, um, during the flyby of Pluto and uh, our daughter Maddie was born during the flyby of the other object which I know they renamed so I apologize it's not Ultima Fuel but it's something else now um, by the New Horizons mission so yeah it's pretty pretty wild you know that's really great um, uh I really love talking to you, of course. I still want to know what's your go-to <laughs> drink before we Oh, finish. Yeah, um, Earth's most pre precious uh, resource of water, of course. But um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it cha it's changed over time. But um, I do appreciate a good kind of single malt scotch. Um, I've always been a rummy, um, so I like my rum. And I like beer. I mean. I like half of Isons and um, more on the fruity side, but I also really enjoy a good Guinness. Great. And so Ryan, <laughs> thanks uh, for coming on Space Snacks and always yeah. a pleasure to talk to you. And how can people follow you or where should you, you know, if they want to connect and learn more, what can they do? Sure. Um, the easiest is just social media. All my accounts are at Ryan Space. So just think pigs in space. Um, which is how I originally named my website before I went up to the Arctic. Thanks to my cousin, Natalie, we kind of, I was like, I need help with some ideas. And then that ended up with that. And then it ended up being all my social media handle things uh, shortly after that. Um, so yeah, R-Y-I-N-S-P-A-C-E. Um, and then that'll lead you to everything else. I mean, um, my lab is, all my lab stuff is spacesuit up um, and of uh, our flight ready systems. We have a variety of different handles, but you should be able to find it through either Cyan or myself. Yep. And so yeah. great. Thanks, Ryan. Have an awesome day. Thanks, you too. Take care, everyone.